Hey, guys, I've got books up here. People give us libraries every once in a while, pastors that pass away, different things. And there's some excellent books up here. And you come up here and get you one, take it back. It may be a life-changing book for you. So those that want to come up here, just come on up here and look through those books. I've got some more coming out. I mean, I've got tons of books given to me. Throw that book away. Go throw it in the trash. This one here. You may need this ultimate weight loss solution. I don't know where that came from. Every, every preacher needs those. Throw it away too. Oh, no, they had that. Somebody may want it. They just made money off of it. Praise God. There'll be other people that come in momentarily. We know that the crowd grows as people wake up and uh, finally get in here. But uh, we're glad you're here. Now, what we do in these meetings, I mean, more than likely, if uh, you come to these early meetings like this, 
you don't need 30 minutes of prep and people singing songs to get you in the mood to listen to God. But what we do is we're going to have three speakers this morning. They realize they don't want to step on other people's time, but we got about three hours here to really have an intense time. And um, I think probably we need to think of this as consecra concent conc consecration, no, concentration camp. <laughs> because it, it's some of you, you've never sat in church more than 30 minutes in your whole life. You think, my God. Well, we're not here to have a meeting. We're not here to, it's like when I pray for you. If I prayed for my friend here, Sandy, and she told me she had a, a problem. She doesn't want me praying a flowery prayer. She don't want me to pray a sweet prayer. I don't pray to be heard by people. I pray to be heard by God. And that's the reason we come into meetings like this. Your life is never going to change. You know, if all you've ever done is go to church, I can promise you, you are what you are. And you'll always be what you are if that's all you want from God. And we live today in an hour where God is revealing himself to people in a very special way. And so the reason I do it this way, I've done it this way for, I've been doing conferences like this for about 50 years. So I know what I'm doing. And it frustrates preachers. I've had preachers come in meetings when I had Leonard Ravenhill there, Lenny. Leonard Ravenhill would be there speaking for us. And they would come and get frustrated, go to the hotel. And they said, I thought we were going to come here. Judy, you remember when I had him down in Central Texas, Buffalo, and uh, had all these big wig preachers that came in, people that were over um, a whole district of a denomination. One of them got mad at me because I had jeans on. That was before, before Vineyard start wearing jeans. It was before Vineyard was even born. And, uh, you know, they, they touted we just dressed down. Well, it doesn't make any difference how you dress. It's whether you hear with your heart what God wants to say. And so Brother Ravenhill was there speaking. This guy went to the room and he said at lunch, he said, I thought we were just going to come and change sermon ideas. He didn't make it the ministry. He went and became a carpet salesman. And uh, tragedy is, is that I won't even go there. Anyway, what happened is that we're here to hear God. Old Testament prophets met one another like this. Now, this is my brother by another mother. They go, I know how you're doing. How am I doing? <laughs> That's how they met. Do you understand that? Because they had insight. And so the fellas that we bring in are people that have the same heart we have. And it's taken us a lifetime to find some of them. But it's been the best thing that we've ever seen happen. And we are obligated. I pray for Lenny Hernandez and for his wife and boys so often you wouldn't believe it. I pray for Nick, dear God, it's like I have to sleep with him, and he's over in, in London, and I'm here. But I, I spend whole days just with a burden for Nick and what he's going through. It, it, it's like that you show me your friends and what I'll do, I'll show you your future. Now, if your friends have no inkling of God, if they their mouth is like a garbage can, if they... If they constantly are casting up dirt and mire, the Bible says the wicked are like a troubled sea constantly casting up dirt and mire. If that's the kind of people you want to be around, you're in the wrong place. Because that's not about carnality. This is about God speaking to us, giving us a word. And it's always been that way. But um, it's a joy just to get to be with these guys. And uh, we thank God for what he's done. I, you know, we took an offering last night 
Randy came to me and said, Claddy, you didn't take an offering. I said, I said, Randy, they know how to give. They know how to give. You don't have to beg people that are after the same thing you're after. And so what we'll do is we will mention that you can bring your offering up here and just lay it on the, the um, platform here at the close of service and just think about expense. I don't want them to have to pay for their airfare. I, I, want, I want them to go back blessed. I want Lenny to go back blessed as he goes back up to the field and they're working right now Billy and him are working on doing some meetings through New England and uh, what uh, Billy thinks is going to cost a hundred thousand dollars and what we did is that the first day they mentioned it uh, was on a Friday night and I asked who wants to give toward this we had seven thousand dollars given just by me saying who wants to participate to get Billy and the team to go up through New England and preach the gospel and be with Lenny. There's no telling. Boy, I've got, good Lord, i got goose pimples on goose pimples. Jesus, help me now. Whew. I'm not messing around, folks. I feel the presence of God when I said that. Wow. Jesus, help me now. i got goose pimples as big as hubcaps. You don't even know what that is. Amen. Wow, wow, wow. Let's just pray about that right now. Let's just pray about the outreach into New England. There'd be a voice and not an echo that they would literally break the silence. They would disturb the silence, the spiritual deadness that's through New England. My God, you put this in their heart. You know the need. Spirit of the living God. Lord, we just asked you to activate the possibility. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Have your way in New England today, Lord. Praise God. Any of you get to watch the program that Bill McGrain set up for us to do with Lance Wall now? Any of you get to see that? Have you seen it yet? Uh, how many have not seen it? Okay, go on your phone right now. You got your phone, just type in Lance Wall now. And it was the program that played yesterday. He has 750,000 people that view his program. And uh, I, I'm telling you right now, I think he's one of the clearest voices about what needs to happen in America there is and he's a Holy Ghost man and he's got a desire to see the nation change he's going to have Bill and I back on in August because he was impressed with what we were talking about that the pastors and businessmen need to get connected and they need to begin to do things at the grassroots in America to change things and so he thinks this is a model to have our intercessors praying like they do. I do too. Uh, Sherry Brackney, come up here. I want you to pray for this meeting this morning as we start this. This is what I'm talking about. This is people that have been quiet. She is the sweetest, quietest lady. I don't know if Mark would agree with that, but she is a sweet, quiet lady. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to just pray for the meetings this week and pray for our speakers this morning. I, I just wanted to say one thing when you were talking about their um, outreach in New England. If everybody remembers the movie White Christmas, 1954, Bing Crosby, one thing I thought was always interesting when they said, when they were on the train and getting off in Vermont, they said, what, something about not being able to find snow and that's as rare as finding a Democrat in Vermont. 1954, they were talking about how rare it was to find a Democrat in Vermont. Where are we today? I think we can turn it completely around. So Heavenly Father, we just pray. We pray over this meeting today. I want to pray over Lenny and Billy, Lord God, that they will t flip New England on its ear, Lord God. Flip them over, Lord God, that now then it will go back to be able to saying, 
it's, it's rare to find, and uh, nothing against Democrat, we'll say against liberals, against wokeism, Lord God. So we just pray for them, Lord God. We will be with them, and, and the prayer force will be praying with them too, Lord God. Because again, this, this is what it's all about. This is, this is the grassroots thing of getting into the people because it is the people that are gonna have to take charge and make a difference. And there was just one scripture, and I, I can't remember the whole scripture, but the one thing that just keeps chiming in my head is when Paul said in Corinthians to the church, awake to righteousness, awake to righteousness. So wake up, wake up the people, wake up the people in the church. And we pray for these meetings, Lord God, to bring us a, a passion, a passion, Lord God, that we've never had before to start in this grassroots, Lord God, to remember this, we're, we're praying so, for so many big things that we need to start praying into our, our local issues, our local people, Lord God, and bring these people up to bring righteous people. It is more important than ever. It is time for the church, time for the church to get involved in that political arena and bring righteousness back to this nation. So Lord God, we just pray over these speakers today. I, I, I pray over Nick, I pray over Lenny, Lord God. I just lift them up, Lord God, that we're open our, our eyes, open our hearts to, to hear wonderful things from your word that will take them to heart, Lord God, and that will take them outside in Jesus' name. Amen. Alan, come if you will. I felt like you need a little dash of hope this morning. And this guy's a hope peddler, amen. How many of you like to be a hope peddler? Come right on, Alan, amen. God bless Alan Scarella. Good morning, everybody. You know, Pastor, what an honor, what an honor to uh, take part in a great, great meeting. It's already been great, hasn't it? You know, sometimes... Uh, the older I get, the more I realize preaching is more than what we realize. Let me, let me explain. Preaching was caused by the direct consequence of sin. If there had never been no sin, there would not have been no need for preaching. There will be no preaching in heaven. Just worship, praise, and thanksgiving. Amen? So preaching was caused by the consequences of sin. And God chose preaching. That was God's choice. And he chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that believed, didn't he? It didn't say foolish preaching, foolishness of preaching. So God loves preaching, don't he? And when I was thinking about, Pastor had contacted me a few days ago, and he, uh, if Pastor Clady wants to get a hold of you, he'll, if, if, he'll say, text me or call me. So I, I was thrilled, Pastor, because I know what God originates, God orchestrates. In other words, this whole meeting, every speaker, everyone that takes part is kind of like, we get the word orchestrate, orchestra. And it all is put together and arranged and combined together to uh, achieve a maximum effort. And uh, I just pray that I can do my part. I sought the Lord and I even prayed about the order, Pastor, whatever that you would place me. So here we go. Luke 22 in God's word. Luke chapter 22, I will read a few scriptures, and I uh, covet your prayers, and I want you to use something that it's on the theme of passion. If you'll follow me, I, I will get to it. So in Luke 22, uh, a very familiar reading, verse 31, uh, the, uh, here we are, uh, uh, during the Last Supper, they'd already taken communion. And in verse 31, the Lord said, Simon, Simon. Of course, he's directing this to Peter. Behold, Satan hath desired to have you. 
uh, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And you'll notice he said unto him, Lord, I'm ready to go with thee to prison, both to prison and death. And when he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. I'm, I'm going to be dealing today with sometimes we think our passion for the Lord is greater than really what it is. And sometimes the Lord allows a test to prove to us just where the gauge of our passion is. And I'll get to it, I promise, but Jesus is directly speaking here to Peter and he's given him a warning and instruction and an encouragement because later on that night, we see Peter fall tragically. And with that in mind, I want to preach this morning my part. It's the bounce that counts. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's the bounce that counts. Now we're going to deal with this passion, losing it and regaining it. Amen. Uh, I want, I want you to see that the fall of man goes way back to Adam, the first man. So for a man to fall is really not nothing new. And Proverbs 24, 16, a just man falleth seven times and riseth again. Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. Now, I, I want you to think about something. Scientists say that there are four factors involved in a bounce. Four factors involved in a bounce. And they use the word fire. Everybody say fire. Fire. F-I-R-E. And those are the four factors. Because you've got the fall, F. you got I, the impact. You got R, the rebound, and you got E, the elevation. And when you study the life of Peter, where's my ball, sis? Precious wife. She's here on the front seat with her precious sister. Praise God. She wasn't here if I didn't make that match. <laughs> he, 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 thank you, Pastor. I would if I had it on me. <laughs> the bounce. The bounce. You got the fire factors. Four factors involved in a bounce. I'm preaching on it's the bounce that counts. We're, we're dealing with passion here today. And it's just us, so let's enjoy the service. It's the bounce that counts. I may need this back. But I, I, I want to deal with it. And if you'll allow me to dash quickly through these four things, the fire, the impact, the, the uh, rebound, and the elevation, uh, we can relay you a message that I feel like will help you not just today, but in days to come in this last hour. You see, to fall means to, 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 to lose one's balance or self-control, to stumble caused by a force of gravity, a downward descent. And here we see Peter, he falls. Every Christian has their ups and downs. You just have to pastor for a while to find that out. And you know, even churches have their ups and downs. Laodicea was once a great church. But when Jesus looked at them, 
what Jesus saw and what they saw in themselves, their passion was nothing like what Jesus evaluated them. That's why if you take someone's temperature, we, we, you know, and the th thermostat, thermometer, uh, we get that thermo word. Uh, and, and if someone has a temper, it means that they, they're hot-headed. And, and, and temperature, uh, the church was not hot. The Lord wanted the church hot, but he said, you're neither cold nor hot, you're lukewarm. Lukewarm Laodicea. And their passion had died and they'd fallen into the, 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 uh, the, the sins of their day. Am I right? So Peter's passion was really not what he thought it was. Because Peter said, Lord, not me. I'll go to prison. Lock me up for your name. Kill me for you, Lord. But Jesus already knew. He said, Peter, it's not that way. It's not that. If you're going to lie, don't lie to Jesus. <laughs> I mean, seriously. So, so that's the fall. When you think about the fall, you've heard that word. Somebody said, I was working out in the yard yesterday. I was working hard and I just petered out. You've heard that phrase. It's a phrase. It's a, a, a pretty popular phrase. I petered out. They get it from this scripture. I looked it up. Google it. Where did the phrase I petered out from? It means that St. Peter, when I read it and looked it up recently, it said it's linked to St. Peter when his faith faded and he lied and denied. He petered out. He fell. And so many are doing that in this hour. But let's move on to impact A forceful contact. A powerful effect something has on a situation, an impact. You see, an egg will splatter when it makes its initial impact, but a ball will bounce. Why? We're going to get to that. There is a thing. I like it. How many like to horseback ride? How many has horseback ridden? You're not like to? I used to. I'll tell you why. There is a saying that says heaven is closer on horseback. So one day, some years back, when I was much younger, I know, I know you ain't going to believe it, but I'm pushing 69 in September. 69, I am. Man, this stuff, I was watching last night online because I worked late till eight. I, don't ask me what I thought that was. <laughs> I may have to take a sip. But here's what I want to say, and we're having time. Me and a friend loaded up the two horses in the trailer and off we went to ride horses over here at Eastgate, East Fork, East Fork by the lake. We got out, unloaded the horses and we, you know, we got everything ready, saddled them up and I got up on my horse. I do not know to this day whether we got the saddle too tight and, and, and the middle part pinched the horse. I, I don't know what happened. But when I got up on my horse, started acting funny. I could tell the, the horse was fidgety and just not acting right. And about that time, uh, he don't want me to drink that. <laughs> but the horse started really acting crazy and it went to bucking. And it wouldn't do that. It went to bucking and kicking and, and rearing up on me. I thought I was Roy Rogers Jr. I mean, I'm going, what's going on? My horse is going nuts. And I'm going, and I pull back on the reins as hard as I could. Ho, ho. And about that time, that leather right rein snapped in my hand. I went, oh, dear Lord. I got one rein 
on the left rein. And this horse is, I mean, you would have thought, Pastor, I was in the rodeo. This bad boy was up and down and going. And all I could re think of was Christopher Reeves. Remember when he went overboard, over the top of that head? There I went. I flew before I knew it, I was airborne. And I went over top and that horse was knocking his head down and going up and down. And I, I, I went up and, and it had not rained for a month. And, and the ground was hard as concrete. I know because I hit, I impact. And when I hit, I, all I can remember flying through the air was, oh my God, Christopher Reeves, don't, don't, get, don't, don't break your neck. My God, you're gonna hit, but don't break your neck. And I turned and my right clavicle and my shoulder, I shattered and I busted this right clavicle and ribs down the right side. And it knocked the wind out of me, Pastor Clayton, and I laid down. Ah. Have you ever had the wind knocked out of you? Yeah. <laughs> And I said, oh, oh, God. And everybody that was around, other horse, horsemen, trailers, and they come running. Horse run off. That rascal, he better run off. I was going to whip. I, I, I wasn't in no shape to whip nobody, brother lady. <laughs> Man, I got up. They, they helped me up. They put me in a chair. They said, here, take one of these. <laughs> it was a pain pill. I said, I, I, I said, all right, I'll, I'll try this. I later on got home. Man, I collapsed in bed. I said, something's wrong. Next morning I got up and went, oh God, all over. And I said, I better go to the hospital. And that's when I found out the right clavicle and three ribs were broke. I hit and then I hurt. Oh, it was horrible. I mean, it took me days and days to recover from that hurt and hit. I'm talking about it's the bounce that counts. We're getting into this passion here today. My part of the service. You see, folks, amen, not only was it the fall of the word fire and the eye, the impact, but the rebound. Did you know that the word rebound literally comes from the word rebounce? If you shoot a basket at a goal, it will rebound in that it will rebounce. Amen. The word, uh, and you will either rebound or explode when something like Peter went through takes place. And if you don't break, you can bounce. But it all depends on what you're made out of. Now, this is where I'm working. And pastor, you told me to be transparent. Remember that? So I'm going to work on this. Because we know we all, we all, uh, we all work on this. Eutychus was a young man. He fell from the third loft and it killed him. Man, falls are dangerous, folks. Fall can kill you. And, but it was a midnight miracle that night when Paul ran down and through prayer and power, he got up again. Eutychus. One preacher said, Eutychus too, if you fell that far. My God, Eutychus. Amen. There he was. Man, that young man. Man, I'm so glad. I'm here to report to you that young people can fall and get back up again because it's a bounce that counts. But this is what I want to work on, on your passion. And my God, I've been praying, Lord, let my passion be what it is. What makes the difference? What makes an egg burst and a ball bounce when they hit on impact? Because of what you're made out of. What you have inside. You see, let me see that ball again, wife. My precious, beautiful wife. Watch this. The pressure inside this ball is greater than the pressure on the outside. That's what makes it bounce. An egg don't have that. That's why it bursts when it makes impact. Now this is where I'm going in my message today. And I need to tell you that this rebound, that God wants everybody, maybe you feel like you're here today and I don't know why I got this message. I've never preached nothing like this before. But this is all I had. Somebody asked me when I pastored a couple of churches, one in Missouri and one in Kentucky, Pastor, how do you know what to preach? I said, you just feel like preaching this more than you feel like preaching anything else. That's just how it goes. And so God lays things on you. So there we are, the rebound. You see, one thing I've learned about the Lord 
is that God always provides an answer before the devil ever presents a problem. And you're going to see this in Peter's life. God always provides an answer before the devil ever presents a problem. Let me give you a case in point. Jesus was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Now, Jesus tells Peter, he said, now Pete, look here. I'm not gonna stop it. I'm not gonna intervene, but the devil has desired to have you. I know this because I've been watching your life and I've been seeing what the devil's up to. It's his strategy. And he said, but I have prayed for you. That's past tense. The brother ain't even went through the trial yet and Jesus is already on top of it because God always provides an answer before the devil presents a problem. My God, somebody shout on that. My God, have mercy. Woo! So here we go. Here's what I gotta say. Jesus says something encouraging. He says, Peter, when... Thou art converted. Strengthen thy brethren. That has got to be the most awesome thing Jesus could personally speak to you. In other words, Peter, you're going to blow it. Your passion is not where it should be. I've got the gauge. I can see where your passion line is, but you're going to blow it. But when? Not how. I ain't going to tell you how. But when? My God. When thou art converted. Strengthen thy brethren. Wow, for Jesus to tell you that you know what, Peter? I see you going into the trial, going through the trial, and coming out the other end of the trial. And when you are converted, strengthen your brother because your passion is coming back. Amen. Am I the only one that ever lost their passion? Don't tell me that because Laodicea did. Many did because my Bible said many forsook him and followed no more. Demas hath forsaken me having loved this present world. Don't tell me, don't tell me people have not lost out. But I came to tell you it's the bounce that counts. Jesus was looking around. And do you remember, do you remember Brother Billy when Jesus said to Peter, he said, you're going through something, Peter, real soon. But I have prayed for thee. And what was the prayer? That thy personal faith, thy faith. Every one of us has a major of faith. Fail not. Everybody say fail. Do you know that word fail in the Greek is eclipo? Say that with me, eclipo. That's where we get the English word, eclipse. <laughs> Jesus was saying, Peter, Satan is going to get between me and you. You know what happens when there's an eclipse? The, the moon gets between the earth and the sun. And Jesus was saying, Peter, I'm praying for you because, and that your faith fail not because if you lose your faith, I can't stand with you. You're alone. And he said, Peter, I'm praying. And how many times has the devil tried to step in between you and the son, the S-O-N? Has you ever had that happen? But Jesus said, I prayed for you with your passion. Peter was too weak. His faith was not as strong as he thought it was. Fear and weakness, weakness gripped him. And Jesus even had to rebuke the disciples the night of the crucifixion pastor. And he said, could you not watch one hour? And he also said earlier to him, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Watch and pray. That phrase has been spoken by Jesus to his disciples more than once. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. I, I want you to get this. Don't miss this. Watching is sighting the enemy. Praying is fighting the enemy. 
Did you hear me? And Jesus said, if you want to be successful, you must watch and pray. You know, I have a friend that encourages me. I'm a preacher friend of mine in Oklahoma. We go back and forth. We actually went to Bible school together. And we're always, you know, throwing out a tidbit to each other. And he told, said something the other day that blessed me. He said, when you don't feel like praying, force yourself. Because there is a force that's trying to force you not to pray. You know it's true, church. If you do not know this, you're not a prayer warrior. Because force yourself to pray. I don't know about you, but every time I get down to pray, my phone's ringing, something needs done, the devil tells me and reminds me, am I the only one that says, Alan, your left tire on your car rear needs air. I mean, stupid stuff. Go water your tomato plants. I mean, wait, 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 wait. We'll get, you know what I've learned to do, Pastor Lenny? I take a notepad now, Brother Nick, and I write that down. Don't forget to water the plant. Okay, lay that down. Jesus, Jesus, Lord, help the meeting. Amen. He said, go get, go get some air in the towel. Thank you, devil. I forgot about that. Amen. Amen. I'm preaching all. It's the bounce that counts. Because let me tell you something. Prayer will either, amen, crucify your flesh or your flesh will crucify prayer. Amen. I'm telling you, I'm telling you when it's hardest to pray, pray hardest. But I'm going to tell you, well, this is where I had a problem early on when I was that skinny, black-headed preacher. You remember that? You know, you know, Pastor Clay, I'm going to tell you, you, do, you may not remember this, but there was a woman that you pastored for years. And her sister came to my church. And I left here to go to Missouri. And she called me, her sister, when she died. And she said, Brother Allen, will you come and fly back to Kentucky and preach my sister's film? And this brother right here, the first time I ever met him I told my wife I told everybody my boys I said man I sought God for this message brother Billy I did my best and guess who came up to me at the end of the service there you know pastor Clinty Keith over there at Heritage you walked up to me and said son I'm telling you something you forevermore minute you remember that you said you ministered to this family son and I wanted I said is he a senator? The mayor of Newport? It was over in Newport. And I said, who, who is this guy? And I said, sir, who are you? And he said, Pastor Clay. I said, wow. Man, I was, I was on cloud nine. I said, hey, guess who, guess who bragged on me today? You know, when you got somebody like that, here I am, a young, young preacher preaching, and, and come in, and I, I didn't want to do it. I don't know, who wants to preach your funeral? It ruins your whole day. <laughs> you know it's the truth. Man, praise God. I ain't kidding you. You think it's funny, don't you? Allison Rose Funeral Home, downtown, Covington. I don't know why. My church was close to them at the time. And they called me one time. And a boy, 6'2", real handsome, real nice, beautiful, red hair. Some dude, he mouthed off and got pulled a gun. Boom! Shot him right in the heart and he run off. Hey man, run off. And he was with three guys. And they called me and said, hey, hey, brother, Al, can you preach your funeral next Thursday? I go, hmm, let me look. Hey, I guess I can. So what's going on? I, I don't even know this guy. Well, he's about 17. He smarted off, and a guy in Covington jerked a gun out one night and shot him dead in the heart. And his mom's a backslider, and she said, I want somebody to preach his funeral. Man, it'll ruin your whole day. Whew, man, I never will forget that. But the Lord helped me, and I did the best I could. That's all you can do is tell what the Lord said. But you see, folks, here, here's what I'm getting at. So I was busy. I had a radio broadcast, and then we went into a full-fledged building program. Man, and we were building a brand-new church, and guess who got most of the, you know, get the bricklayers together? The dudes that 
you know, there's cranes out of London that come and set these bad dudes on their pillars. And I mean, everything has to be tied and synced. And I mean, I, I even was asked, would you help us pick out the church furniture? Which I was glad because I love good oak. So I'm going on, on, on. And man, I was working eight to 10 hours a day. Needless to say, when you're real busy, you cut out the things you don't think really matter. But I found out the hard way, Pastor, your walk with the Lord is more important than your work for the Lord. I found that out the hard way. Man, there I was. There I was. Because you know what I found? And I just want to put this out to everybody. And maybe the preachers will get, grab this because I didn't realize this before. Did you know a natural shepherd does not eat the same food the natural sheep eat? No, no, they don't graze in grass. No, no, no. But the spiritual shepherd must, I said he must eat the same food the spiritual sheep eat and even more for that matter. Because guess what? He's got to turn right around and feed the sheep. That's what Jesus told Peter. Feed my sheep, lovest thou me. I'm working toward close, but here's what I want to do. So I talked to you about the fall, fire. I, the impact. R, the rebound. But now I got to get to that last part, E, elevation. Because it's the bounce that counts. And this is what's really interesting. There's more scientifically involved in a bounce than what meets the eye. The world says, and help me out here, the bigger they are, the... But guess what Jesus says in God's word? The harder they fall, ball please, ball please, the harder they fall, the higher they bounce. Amen. Amen. That's how God deals with it. Because the Lord is a God of restoration. God wants you. Because somebody said, the Lord would rather restore you than replace you. Oh, I'm just preaching what I got, brother. That's it. You know what the message Bible says about this? Stay on your toes, Peter. Satan has tried his hardest to separate all of you disciples from me like chaff from wheat. But I prayed for you that you don't give up or give in. But when you come through the time of testing, turn to your companions and give them a fresh start. Wow. Wow. Jesus wanted Peter to reignite his passion because he knew he was made out of the right kind of stuff. How you know Peter was made out of the right kind of stuff, brother? I'm going to show you why. Out of all the disciples, when Jesus asked the question, who do men say that I am? Nobody answered but Peter. And he said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said, you're right, Peter. Flesh and blood have not conferred. When Jesus came walking on the water in the storm, all of a sudden, people was asking who is it? It's a ghost. And all of a sudden, Peter said, Lord, if it be you, he's the only one, bid me to come. And Jesus, what did he say? Come. And here's what I like. Peter stepped out on the C, the O, the M, and the E. But when that rascal stepped off that E... <laughs> And he looked around and seen the waves and the wind. Have y'all ever stepped off the E and said, hey, 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 Lord, and beginning to sink. I preached one time on the shortest prayer in the Bible. Lord, save me. And God reached out and picked him up. See, see, Jesus had too much invested in Peter. He had too much invested in the brother. Hey, man, but this is what I like. I'm moving, I'm moving. Here we go. Jesus was saying, Peter, your sifting has moved you into your shifting. <laughs> Did you get that? Your shifting has moved you into your shifting because I'm fixing to give you the keys of the kingdom. And Peter preached afterwards, after Pentecost, before Pentecost, 
Peter was backward Peter. After Pentecost, bold Peter. Before Pentecost, Peter cut the ears of men with a natural sword. After Pentecost, Peter caught the ears of men with the sword of the Spirit. Before Pentecost, Peter was afraid of his own shadow. After Pentecost, Peter's shadow healed the sick as he walked down the street. <laughs> After the fall came the fire, the fire. Hey, I'm preaching to somebody. Maybe you feel like preacher, I blew it, I blew it, I blew it, I blew it. Hey man, I feel I'm just not what I should be. I used to be more on fire for God. I had more of a passion than I ever had. But you see, and I never noticed this, Pastor, until I studied this. Jesus said, when thou art converted, that word converted is only used a handful of times, not this many times in the Bible, and just a few in the New Testament. But watch this. This was the end of Luke. And I never saw this until recently. In Acts chapter 3, and in verse 19, when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Acts 3.19, after the healing of the lame man at Gate Beautiful, the Jews, his fellow brethren, came and said, what, what is this? What mean it? What's going on? Peter jumps up, and Peter's standing with the 11. Hey, you talking about the guy that was backing down? He's standing up. <laughs> after the fall came the fire. What happened? The Bible said Peter steps up and says, Repent ye to my fellow brother men and brethren, and be converted that the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. You can be converted. The reason I can tell you that, it happened to me. Because it's the bounce that counts. Now, 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 now. Now, let me, let me do this. Peter went on to write 1st and 2nd Peter. And in 1st Peter, this is so neat. You know, because when I begin to study, you know, Peter, you have to really read into things. Let me show you an example. How many love that scripture? Casting all your care upon him, for he cared for you. 1st Peter, you know what? He's a fisherman. He was using a fisherman's term. Casting. Hey, man, when I care, I love to fish. Here's my sister-in-law. Do I fry some mean crappie? Oh, yeah. She, I fried her crappie that day with my wife. And then I said, here, here's some bluegill and bass fillets. Take them home. Already frozen in water. Here's what I'm saying. Peter knew things because he lived it. In 1 Peter Hey man, notice this 4 7. He writes, Be sober and watch under prayer. Wonder where he learned that. Be sober, be watchful. Hey, he learned it because he went through a horrible situation. I'm trying to get somebody to tell you you can get your get your uh, bounce back. Now, I promise, give me three more minutes, I'm done. So next preacher, get your gun loaded. Cock it back. Praise God. Here it is. How many disciples did Jesus have? Mm -hmm. But two major disciples fell. Judas fell. How do we know? He fell for the plot. The chief priest said, hey, Pete. Hey, bro, how about if we give you 30 big ones? 30 round silver. And he said, yeah, but my Savior. He said, no, no, no. We're going to blot that out. We're going to put a big piece of silver in your eye, and you're going to lose track of the Savior. And so Peter said, well, hmm, I could use 31. So Peter sells Jesus out, and he falls for the plot to, you know, uncover Jesus. And then when the brother was beat up with grief and, and guilt, he goes out to the edge of a cliff, and the brother finds him a tree, but it must have been a bad branch. My God, he couldn't even kill himself good enough. Climbs out on that branch. Hey, man, I don't know if he gained weight or whatever he done, but the brother done put a noose over his neck, and he jumped off the branch, and the Bible said he fell headlong and burst. Isn't that what your Bible says in Acts? He burst, and his bowels gushed out. He fell. But Peter fell too. What's it, what happened? Didn't you remember me telling you that an egg will burst upon impact, but a ball will bounce depending on 
What's inside? The passion. Peter never really lost that. It consumed him. But this is what I want to get to real, real quick. This, that's this. And, and here's the part. Historians tell us at the end of his life, Peter was crucified. And when they said, we're going to kill you like we did your, your Jesus, he said, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm not worthy to be crucified like him. And historians tell us that Peter said, look, look, he said, I'm not worthy. Crucify me upside down. And I'm here to tell you that Peter died in the faith. And this is the way I'm going to end the message. Let it burn in your soul. It's the bounce that counts. While Judas crashed and burned, Peter crashed and learned. <laughs> Has anybody here ever crashed? While Peter, cr I mean Judas crashed and burned. He burned. Hey, brother, brother Cliddy, man, I heard a preacher. You know, I worked all day yesterday. I'd have been here. I, I've not missed the service, but yesterday I worked all day. Uh, got off eight. And I heard this preacher preaching yesterday, and, 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 and most of us preachers probably pay more attention to the Word of God than anybody else. This guy's up preaching, and I've never heard this. Never. He's preaching away on David, and he goes, David, sin with, you, with your eyes, white Bathsheba. And he goes, but he said, I want you to know something, church. He's a Baptist preacher, eternal security. Once saved, always saved. Once in the grass, always in the grass, unless the cow takes a notion to jump the fence. <laughs> and here's how he preached it, Pastor Lenny, and I about blew, I about wrecked my car. Thank God my car stayed on the road. Brother Clady, this rascal got up and he's preaching away. And usually I like to hear the brother, you know, and he's going away and he said, notice church, in a church full of thousands, notice this, Peter never prayed in Psalms, restore unto me my salvation. Because he didn't lose it. He just prayed. He said, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. I'm, he said, because the brother, he had, a, he had a little broken relationship. He never prayed, restore unto me my salvation. Notice that, church. Because you can't lose your salvation, he said. Whoa, whoa. I said, God, who in the world else is listening to this than beside me? No wonder, Pastor, we're fighting headlong. But I got to tell you, Pastor, as I hand you the mic, it's the bounce that counts. It is the bounce that counts. Okay, we're going to take five minutes, and you guys can go to the restroom, get you a drink of water. If you need a bottle of water, I'll sell you one for free. And you can go back in the parlor and get it. Amen. George, get some cold water and bring it out here for him. Amen. Just bring that ice chest out here. Just go ahead and dismiss yourself. Take five minutes. We'll start back here at uh, 1021. 1001. I have coffee in the back. I have coffee in the back. If somebody wants coffee, just make sure you put the top on it. Here's the water right here. The water is right over here.
It's the bounce that counts. Amen. Praise God. Who stole that ball? I didn't ask you to get that ball back. It's the bounce that counts. Everybody said it's the bounce that counts. Here you go, Hoosier. There you go, Hoosier. It's the bounce that counts. Throw that to somebody. It's get up and bounce it. It's a bounce it counts. <laughs> what a pass. Hey, Pastor, can I say something? Yeah. Look at this. My wife got me this, and I blew it up, and it said, so here's our, our colors, made in China. I know. That's what Costco is. How many of you know what Costco represents? Gary told me. How many of you know what it, it stands for? China Overseas Company. Wow, I didn't know that. Amen. Where's Gary? Y'all can blame him. Amen. China Overseas Trading Company. That's what it is. China Overseas Trading Company. Sounds for Sam from, it stands for Arkansas. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. 
No doubt. Here you go, Brian. It's the bounce that counts. Stand up and bounce that ball. That's the bounce that counts. You're going to bounce? Tell him how hard you fall. That's good. Steve, don't just sit there. It's the bounce that counts. Throw it to Gary. He needs it. Amen. It's the bounce that counts. Whoa. Well, you never know where you're going to end up, that's for sure. Amen. Praise God. Everybody said it's the bounce that counts. Amen. Let's stand for a second. Kind of rest yourself. Did you enjoy this? Amen. Thank God for Alan. You know, he was transparent with us. And we thank God for that. We're going to ask right now that that our friend Nick would come. Where is Nick? Oh, there's Nick. He is back there in the back talking to his wife, Malinga. She's closing the deal right now. I want everybody to pray. The deal is done. Come on. She, she really works in high market. And I'm serious. Pray a real prayer. Don't just say, Lord, bless Malinga. But she's making a very serious deal right now. And so, just like the deal was done when Jesus died on the cross, just like the deal was done when he saved you, just like the deal was done when he heals you, just like the deal was done when he called you, the deal is done. Amen? And so let's pray. The deal is done for Malinga and Nick right now over in London. The deal is done in Jesus' name. There in that office building with Malinga as she wheels and deals for the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Now, you don't know anything about Nick except he can roar like a lion. Let me tell you something about him that you do not know. They have never received a penny from their church where they pastor. They make their living outside of that because it is so exorbitant. It costs so much money to have just a building, just a place there in London. You can't imagine how high the property values are. When they went there, how long have we known each other? Seven years or so? Eight years? 2013. Since uh, when they came to England, that was like about, how long have you been there now? Uh, 23, years. 23 years. So I've, I've known them since 2013. That's nine years. And so they had not been there very young. They came from Zambia. His father was a governor, mayor over a big, part of Zambia. You've been to Zambia lots of times. But um, he was a high-ranking official. And um, God called Nick into the ministry. His salvation story is an amazing story. Actually, we were in a car going across London. I don't remember a thing about what we saw that day. Because I had Randy Lee telling his story of how he got saved which is a story to be told. I had uh, Bubba McCann in the car with us telling about his story of his salvation, how he was out on, uh, in a hurricane tied to a buoy going up and down in a boat and crying out to God to save him and forgive him. And then I had Nick telling his story. It was the greatest ride through London I had ever had. I go through London faster than you can go through, a, you know, a history book, I promise you. But uh, it was a wonderful story of salvation. Really what this all has to do with is our salvation and his passion to save us. Amen. And so thank God for Alan. Thank God for Nick. Lenny will tie it all together at the end. And then Lenny's going to be preaching tonight. We'll have someone give us, you know, talk a little bit. Billy's going to be speaking at some time. Scott will be back running the meetings. His son just left to go back over to the West Coast, be praying for Nathan. 
he is over. I, I don't think I can even tell you how, how this job is. He's over all of the special forces in the Western Hemisphere. All the special forces in the Western Hemisphere, not just on the West Coast. And so be praying for him that God would protect him and give him wisdom and that he would be on guard because if he's not awake, we're not safe. It's just that, just that real. If, if Nathan is not awake, then we're not safe. That's how big his job is. So be praying for him like he was your son, like he was your watch commander. Amen. God bless you. This is my friend, Nick Chanda. Thank you very much, Pastor Clady. Please help me to put your hands together for Pastor Clady Keith. And uh, he's taught me a lot. High mileage, low maintenance. And so there's a lot that I've learned from him. Uh, the ride he's talking about was a transformational moment. We were like five of us in the car, Pastor Clady, Randy Lee, and uh, we had Baba, we had Trent. And by the time we went through all the salvation story, the presence of God was literally loaded in the car. And uh, that changed our lives. And uh, I'm just going to go quickly. And um, uh, my 30 minutes, I, I have to reduce, isn't it? Or oh, I stick to 30. Tell me the instruction before you fire me. <laughs> All right, um, I'm going to read uh, two scriptures, uh, maybe uh, from two different versions. The first one is um, the same scripture from King James Version, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable perf and, uh, perfect will of God. I'm going to read from the Passion Translation, and uh, thank God for laying it up. I heard the interesting story of the one who, who wrote the Passion, and I'm going to interview him better after the service. Beloved friends, what should be our proper response to God's marvelous mercies? I encourage you to surrender yourselves. That word surrender. Surrender yourselves to God to be his sacred living sacrifice and live in holiness, experiencing all that delights his heart, that for, for this becomes your genuine expression of worship. Stop imitating the ideals and the opinions of the culture around you, but be inwardly transformed by the Holy Spirit through a total reformation of how you think. This will empower you to discern God's will as you live a beautiful life, satisfying and perfect in his eyes. Let's pause in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we honor you. We submit our hearts to you. For you don't look at the outside, but you look at the heart. For the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. So we we'll bring our hearts to you. Turn our hearts this morning, O oh God. Father, we desire you to do your perfect will in our lives. But help each one of us. And you have declared that the entrance of your word, it brings light and gives understanding to the simple. Let your word bring light in our lives right now. Illuminate every part of our lives so that we may see clearly. Father, you have said, oh God, isn't your word like fire? Let your word be like fire right now. Let your fire burn every chaff in our lives. That Father, in this end time, let the true passion, almighty God, be revealed. Father, we thank you. We honor you. Thank you for open heavens. Thank you for your angels in this place. And thank you for the Holy Spirit who's taken over and taken charge. In Jesus' name, amen. Our simple title, if you're writing, Sacrifice is the evidence of true passion. 
I'll repeat that. A simple title. Sacrifice is the evidence of the true passion. I want to say for the next few minutes, when we look through the Bible, each time God wanted to test somebody to see the real passion, what you would call them for is sacrifice. When he looked at Abraham, he said, Abraham, you say you love me? Take your only son and take him and sacrifice your only son to me. And so the first test was, number one, obedience. God wants to test our obedience. If there's obedience in us, we'll respond in line. It's not every time God speaks to you that we obey him. There's one great, great, great uncle I've said several times. God told him, Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. He got into the ship, went the opposite direction. So when you hear the voice of God, people say, oh, I heard the voice of God. When you heard, did you obey the voice of God? And so Jonah heard the voice, but he went opposite direction. Abraham heard the voice. I want you to sacrifice, to surrender, to go an extra mile. It will cost you. Take your only son, Isaac, and come and sacrifice him. And he took his son to go and sacrifice him. And at that point, he took the knife ready to sacrifice Isaac. And God said, stop it. Now I know that you obey me. Because the passion he had for God was tested. And it was tested through what? Sacrifice. Sacrifice is what makes a difference for each one of us. What we sacrifice to God is what will prove our passion. If you are passionate about prayer, you sacrifice in prayer. I've read many people sacrificed in prayer. Jonathan Edwards, who prayed and wrote the message, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. He prayed, I think, for is it five days nonstop no, without sleep, praying and crying out. You hear people like John Wesley. They prayed. They woke up at 4 a.m. and prayed. And they said the sun will not rise without John Wesley sacrificing in prayer. Those who have made impact, William Booth, he prayed. The network of churches, I belong to the head of the network of churches. He spent seven hours every single day doing prayer work. Sacrifice. And so, sacrifice shows the passion. When you're passionate about something, there must be a sacrifice. Even for those who get married, they'll tell you that before they got married, there was an element of sacrifice. I remember I was back in Africa, and my wife by, by then was just a, a, a girlfriend trying to make ways to find her and be a, a wife. She's, she would be in the UK and phone me at UK time, 10 p.m., Africa time, midnight. I'll be sleeping, as, but I would hear the phone, landline, wake up, pick up, and say, were you sleeping? I said, ah, no, I was waiting for your call, babe. <laughs> she didn't know it was time for what? Sacrifice. And so it is that part I want, to, uh, I want us to understand. And I want you to take note. Abraham had to sacrifice, and he was stopped by God. Elijah had passion and zeal for the Lord. But what made a difference to prove his passion was sacrifice. The evening sacrifice changed everything over the whole Israel. 400 prophets of Baal were terminated because his passion was, the evidence of his passion was in the sacrifice. As soon as God saw the sacrifice, if you're writing, write down this. God always responds to sacrifice. God always responds to genuine sacrifice. There are things that I've done in my life when I've run out of ideas and I've just gone into sacrifice mode. That's all I know. But the told, you know, the church building we are in is like uh, one third of this, I think. Maybe one third. You have to divide one, two, three. 
But in the UK, it costs just a small piece of land, 1.5 million. 1.5 million pounds. In dollars, it's like 2 million. Yeah, 2 million dollars. Just a small piece of land. We ran out of ideas. There was nothing. We put all the properties as a, a guarantee. We said we're going to get it. And when everything wasn't working out, I had no idea. All I could remember is sacrifice. Engaged into 70 days of fasting without food, fluids only. And I would never encourage anybody to do that. You are more closer to heaven than you know. <laughs> because you can easily evaporate. And that sacrifice at the end of 70 days, I was expecting money would rain from heaven. All I got was a word. You are born to be a solution. I said, God, will I take this to the bank? Born to be a solution? How would they respond? Before we knew it, God started orchestrating unusual things around. The next door neighbors to the church wanted to change their, uh, their, their, their place, which used to be an office, into an apartment. They paid us uh, almost 100,000 pounds. For 100,000 pounds for a, how many inches? I think maximum five inches of piece of land. Five. Just a car park. And we're like, surely God takes the foolish things of this world. What was the response was a sacrifice. I brought the sacrifice of fasting to him. I had run out of ideas. I'd prayed in tongues. I'd prayed in understanding. I'd quoted all the scriptures. I'd done everything. But the only thing I knew left was what? Sacrifice. Elijah brought sacrifice. God responded. Abraham brought sacrifice. God responded. What was it all about? It was the evidence of their passion for their God. That evidence of passion for your God will require sacrifice. Because of time, let me quickly move to the, another example of sacrifice. I wish I had time and I would have gone through each one of them and showed you the details. But the next one, a young man who had no idea, taken over from a great father who was a mighty warrior. David, a mighty warrior, he had, he had killed Goliath. He had done many wars. He had won many battles. The son takes over, and he has no idea. He says, I'm a little child. I don't know what to do. But one thing that Solomon did was what? Sacrifice. This is my passion for my God. I'll sacrifice a thousand bulls to you. No one has ever done this. I'll go an extra mile. He went an extra mile. And that sacrifice showed his passion for his God. And God said, okay, I'll give you wisdom. I'll give you even the wealth that you just asked for wisdom. I'll give you this and give you that. Because God received the sacrifice. I'm saying to Nick, what is the sacrifice that you are going to give to your own God right now? Ask him. God, what sacrifice do you want me to give to you? And I'll give you some few examples quickly. Because I just sense in our hearts that there's a need to make an adjustment and prove our passion through sacrifice. I'll give you some few examples. When you go through the Bible, there are a lot of moments of sacrifice. David himself... When David was counting the people and God got angry with him and he said, choose whether to be slain by the enemies or this and that, he said, oh, I'd rather fall into your arms. But there's something that he did. What did he do? Sacrifice. I'm passionate about you, O oh God. And whatever it will take, I'll bring the sacrifice to you. Many times people think sacrifice, it has to be a corporate thing. God has a way of reaching each one of us and telling you, can you sacrifice this if you truly have the passion? You say, I have passion to worship. God will ask for sacrifice. I have passion for prayer. God will ask for sacrifice. To prove that your, to prove that your passion has evidence of sacrifice. Let me give you another example. For God so loved the world. God loved the world. What did he do? 
he sacrificed his own son to prove his passion that he loves you, he loves me, he loves all of us. He had to take the Passover lamb, Jesus, and he sacrificed him to say, this is my passion for you, each one of you. I know you are sinners. You are far from the commonwealth of God, but I have a passion for you. I have loved you with an everlasting love, and my love for you endures forever. All the seven billion people on the earth, this is my sacrifice. I bring my own son to sacrifice him. And he sacrificed his own son to prove his passion for each one of us. I want to say this. If God had to prove his passion for us by sacrifice, what about each one of us? How are we going to prove our passion for the living God? Is there something that God is calling you to say, you want to prove that you have a passion for me? Prove it by sacrifice. I've heard many stories of people who sacrificed their passion and they sacrificed. Reynard Bonke had passion for the lost. And guess the sacrifice he had to go through so many times. I was young in 1980, he came to Zambia and we had no idea what was happening. The amount of sacrifice he came but right opposite our house was this small church which they were using for the counselors. And whenever they started to pray, they would pray all night. And we're like, do these people they never get tired? We didn't know that they were sacrificing. That one crusade he did, he raised so many ministers of the gospel in that nation that carried the fire. One of them was, uh, he became even a vice president of Zambia, Dr. Nevers Mumba. He was raised in those crusades of the sacrifice of Reynard Bonke. He went to Congo. The sacrifice, he lost almost his in, uh, part of his crew through an accident. They died. And the sacrifice that the ministers of the gospel go through to prove their passion for their living God. And say, God, you said, whom shall I send? I said, send I. This is the first thing I want us to take note. Number one. If you want to begin to bring sacrifice to God, the first sacrifice I want to recommend is, number one, if you're writing down, the sacrifice of praise. Every one of us, where this is the only place where we become so easily equal is to praise, to praise God. I'm sure you've heard some people saying, we bring a sacrifice of praise. It's easier to say it, but it's different from when you have to implement it. Uh, the, our mother church, well, well, when I used to be there, we did uh, one week of 24-7 praise. Pr just praising God 24 hours, day and night, for seven days. And uh, at that time, things were hard. Things seemed impossible, but God came through after the sacrifice of praise. Number two is the sacrifice of thanksgiving. When I talk about sacrifice of praise... I'm basically, you're just there praising God. You just lift him up and say, Jesus, you are the king of kings. You are the king of glory. You are the Lord of lords. I praise you. You are the ancient of days. You are the lily of the valley. You are the rose of Sharon. You are the bright morning star. You are the root and offspring of David, the one who was, who is, and is to come. You are the covenant-keeping God. You are the way maker. You are the restorer. You're just praising the living God. The second is thanksgiving. The sacrifice of thanksgiving. Do you know many people you have helped in your life, some of them have never come back to you to say thank you. And that's what Jesus' disappointment was. Ten lepers, all of them, he says, go and show yourself to the priest. Only one of them came back. And he said, were well, they not ten of them? Only one came back to offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving. The third one, is the sacrifice of prayer. I can tell you prayer is a sacrifice. I, when I got saved, I used to wake up at 1 a.m., read the Bible for one hour, pray for three hours every single night. When I got to UK, I tried it and the police showed up. <laughs> I've, had a, I've had the police visit me twice. When I was here in December, I almost caused problems for Pastor Clay in the hotel. <laughs> 
Dave Jones <laughs> took a video. <laughs> I didn't know of me praying. And I was like, oh. He said, if you do that again, the hotel will turn on you. <laughs> so this time I've been clever. I'm going in the toilet, close the door. What you call it the restroom. Close the door. I'm like, hey, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus. Release fire, fire, fire. At least it's quiet. <laughs> no one can record me. <laughs> The sacrifice of prayer, I have seen people whose lives, I like John praying hide. John praying hide, he prayed all night and during the day he did the evangelism. Out of the prayer of John praying hide, many missionaries were set on fire. I like the story of our Pandita Ramabai and others who were raised because this man prayed. And the evangelist would come into the town. They would have massive meetings without knowing it was the prayer of John praying hide. He sacrificed. People like Father Nash, they sacrificed for the, for the life and the ministry of Charles G. Finney. He prayed so much. The sacrifice of prayer caused God to be attracted to the ministry of John uh, Charles G. Finney. That miracles will begin to happen. Because somebody sacrificed and God responds to sacrifice. Sacrifice. When I talk about the sacrifice of prayer, there are many. I lived for 11 years until last year in the back garden of William Booth. William Booth used to say he would pray until his face begins to shine like an angel and go and stand before the pub. And the pub, I don't know what you call a pub in, the, in America. They used to call them tavern and all that, or a bar. That's where he'll go and begin to preach, and they'll take rotten eggs, throw at uh, William Booth. They would hit him with the rotten eggs, but he would still preach. Why? He had passion for the living God, and he had done his sacrifice of prayer and go out to demonstrate his passion for the living God. And this is what God is calling us. Will you prove your passion through sacrifice? There are many areas. You could see the sacrifice of Solomon. He gave a thousand, a thousand bulls. There are others who are called to sacrifice financially. I have seen this miraculous upon moments of sacrifice. Some of them, I'll tell you, when we're trying to get a building, we wrote to every rich Christian we knew. None of them responded. One organization said, we cannot lend you, but to send you a small check. And the check they sent to us was 200,000 pounds, which is roughly like $250,000. Sacrifice. Oh, 300. Okay, $300,000. Sacrifice financially. And I'm believing God that this revival that is beginning this week, God is going to raise people who sacrifice financially and say, look, you don't have to do this. We'll take care of it. That's how Charles G. Finney ministry happened. There were two brothers who sponsored the ministry of Charles G. Finney. And all they said, you concentrate on preaching. You pay the hotel for Father Nash and uh, Abba Clary, but leave us to do this. And God is saying, sacrifice to, the, to that passion. With a few minutes that I have, I just want to say these few things about the sacrifice. There was a moment earlier this year, I, I just felt there's a need for a shift to happen in my life and in the life of the church. Again, I started to do 21 days of fasting, fluids only. I ended up 50 days without food, just fluids. And I was like, God, don't make take me to 70. Please, please. I started to pray that it doesn't take me to 70 days if I need a shift. And suddenly, what started to happen, because the church was shut for nearly two years, we just reopened. That's how the UK is. It's not like here. We are just now starting the rebuilding. Every pastor in the UK is now Nehemiah. It's time to rebuild the war. <laughs> and you won't believe we started to see unusual things begin to happen, unusual meetings. Before we knew it, the local council, were, we are on like on six boards of the local council as a church. Even as I'm speaking, they are calling me early in the morning to organize a meeting uh, to see some more board members. And I said, all this happened 
because of sacrifice. Whatever you are passionate about, it will be proven by the evidence of sacrifice. And this is a call to you and to the live, before the living God. Ask God, God, what do you want me to sacrifice to prove my passion for you? Each one of us will tell you. Somebody may tell you, I want you to offer time for praise, thanksgiving, finance, material, this and that. But whatever God says to you, obey his voice. Like Abraham obeyed. I want to pause and uh, take a few minutes to pray because it is time for sacrifice to prove our passion. Are you passionate about praying for the lost? Are you passionate about reaching out to the homeless, to the sick, to, to the elderly? Whatever your passion is, there is need for the evidence of sacrifice. And the time is now. God is touching somebody's heart and saying, look, rekindle your sacrifice, whether it is in praise, whether it's in prayer, whether it's in worship, whether it's in giving, whether it's in finance, there is need for the evidence of your passion through sacrifice. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We're just going to pray. I'm going to take a minute or two uh, for those who would like to pray and ask God and say, God, I want you to show me clearly the right path and what sacrifice you want me to bring before you Whenever you call me, right now I need clarity. I just don't want to do general sacrifice, specific sacrifice that will bring uh, the evidence for my passion, that I am passionate about you, not just in words, but there is evidence of sacrifice. If there's anybody who would like to pray to join me as I also pray for myself and say, God, what sacrifice do you require of me? You called Elijah, you called Abraham. Abraham, come and sacrifice Isaac. What sacrifice do you want from me? If there's anybody there who would like to pray to join me in that prayer, you can rise to your feet, please, and we just want to pray and ask oh God, Father, the sacrifice that proves, oh my God, my passion for you. Father, show me. Father, help me. Father, empower me. Father, guide me. Father, lead me. If you are there, I want you to just repeat a simple prayer. If you are there and you're standing, you want to pray and say, Father, in the name of Jesus, you have called me to be a living sacrifice. Now, Lord, I want to prove my passion to you. Show me the sacrifice that you require of me at such a time as this. As I pray, speak to me now. Lift your voice and begin to call upon the living God. Begin to call upon the almighty God. God is calling you. He called, I, he called, he called indeed Abraham and said, bring your only son, Isaac, and sacrifice him. There is somebody who's being called right now. God is calling you that it is time to prove your passion through sacrifice. What will you sacrifice for the living God? Will you sacrifice your time? Will you sacrifice your prayer? Will you sacrifice with thanksgiving? Will you sacrifice with praise? Will you sacrifice with obedience? Will you sacrifice with humility? Whatever sacrifice, you are, God is calling you right now and say, prove your passion with sacrifice. Prove your passion with sacrifice. Oh God, Father, we pray that you may touch our hearts, each one of us right now, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, that our Father, enough is enough. We shall not show our passion just in words but in actions of sacrifice. Let the actions of sacrifice that are specific to each one of us, oh God. Father, speak to our hearts. Speak to our lives, oh God. It is time for the evening sacrifice. It is time for sacrifice, oh God. It is time for sacrifice in this end time passion, oh God. It will require the sacrifice of prayer, the sacrifice of evangelism, the sacrifice of giving, the sacrifice of worship, the sacrifice of praise, the sacrifice of thanksgiving. We call upon your God. You sacrificed your only begotten son, Jesus, and we want to imitate your God. You sacrificed your only begotten son, Jesus, for my sake and for the sake of every person. Father, we desire a genuine revival. Almighty God, with that passion for revival, our God, what sacrifice to 
you require from our hearts, from our hearts, from our lives. Oh God, help us now. Visit our hearts. Visit our lives. Visit our families. Visit our church. Visit heritage. Visit every church. Visit every Christian to bring a right sacrifice that will yield a true passion for the living God, for the righteous God, for the ancient of days, for the lily of the valley. A true passion for the covenant keeping God. A true passion for the consuming fire. A true passion for the God that makes a way where there seem to be nowhere. What is the sacrifice that you want us to bring now? Oh God. Our oh Father. Hear our cry, oh God. Feel us, oh God. With a passion that has evidence of sacrifice. Our God, this is our cry and our prayer. Lord, I pray for every person under the sound of my voice. I pray for Nick. Oh Lord, let there be the evidence of the passion that comes forth with sacrifice. Genuine sacrifice before the living God. I pray for Pastor Clady. Father, you can see we are gathered here because he has sacrificed for each one of us to come from many mouths and say, come and release a fresh passion for the living God. And let the times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord in this place that our passion who birth almighty God, mighty revival, our passion who birth of God, a newness in our lives, a newness in our communities, in our our cities in our nation that shall bring the evidence of the glory of God, the glory of God, the power of God, the anointing of God, the fire of God through sacrifice. Respond, my father. I pray right now over your people, baptize every person with all my God a fresh desire to sacrifice to you, O God, as their evidence of passion. My Father, I pray for that person who's here right now. You have an uh, anemic condition. Right now, that anemic condition, I command it to lose you and to go right now in the name of Jesus. Be healed from that anemic condition right now in the name of Jesus. And I pray for that person who's had a problem with the, your asthmatic and that you also have a challenge of hay fever. I don't know who that person is, but God wants to heal you right now. In this atmosphere, when we have brought a sacrifice of prayer before the living God, I speak over your life. Be healed from the hay fever. Be healed from that asthmatic condition right now in the name of Jesus. A family problem of bones. All I can see is a family problem. There's a bone problem, bones in your family. Everyone gets affected with bone issues, whether it's arthritis, I don't know, but it has to do with your bones. But all I know is God is saying, speak to those dry bones. They shall live again. I speak over your dry bones. They shall live again. Those dry bones right now, the sickness that affects your bones right now, be healed now in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit, we love you. I can see somebody's heart has just been touched right now. And the Lord said, there will be no need for a pacemaker. I have healed you and I've healed you. You have been so worried about your heart. The Lord heals you now. Father, we thank you. Let's just love the Holy Spirit is in this place. If you can pray in the Spirit, let's just pray in the Spirit for a minute. Father, we bring a sacrifice of tongues to you right now. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. You may be seated. 
My father-in-law prayed eight, eight hours a day, just like you go to work, clock in. He prayed eight, eight hours a day, sometimes much more than that. He said, for me to begin with, prayer was a duty. But then it became a pleasure because he was in contact with heaven. He was a special man. He was a real man of prayer. Now, I know that the mind can't remember any more than the seat can endure. So we're going to take a five-minute break, but I want you to come back as soon as you can. It's um, five minutes after 11. We're going to turn it over to Lenny, and Lenny is going to take us out. Then Lenny will be speaking tonight. People have asked me about that. Others are coming in. Rick Curry can't stay away. Um, the people in North Dakota, Ken Hall and, and Kara are coming. They'll be here at 4 o'clock this afternoon. And um, they're burning with a passion for First Nations people and for the purpose of God in their life. They've literally given themselves to the purpose of God in their lives. And so they'll be here. And then there's others that are coming. Randy Lee's going to come back. His wife has two appointments with a cancer doctor. She's fought cancer now for about, I don't know, 15 years or so. And so we need to be praying for her this week and that God would just bless her. Randy's probably watching, but um, I can't wait till Randy gets back. He'll be at Friday night, Saturday morning. And then Dave Jones is coming in on Thursday, and uh, we'll just let him do what a Dave Jones does. Amen. Everybody, you know, in Wells is named Jones, and they're all kin. Tom Jones, all of them are named Jones. Amen. But uh, I'm looking forward to what these men have to say. We know, Vernell met me in the parking lot. We know this is a pivotal point in our lives and in this church and in the body of Christ. We, we know. We're not so audacious to think that we're the biggest thing or that we're the only thing. But I believe other men are hearing the need to be more focused than ever before. It's a pivot point. All of the guys feel this. Nick feels it. And uh, Lenny feels it. And Lenny no, needs no introduction, but he's the only Colombian egghead I've ever met in my life. In other words, he's smart. And I won't tell his story. He tells it best. But I want Lenny to come and just share with us what is on his heart. You got five minutes to go do your thing, visit the garden, and then come back. Get you some water. There's water sitting right up here if you need some water. But hurry, hurry, hurry. We'll start back at 11.15. You got seven minutes. Lenny.
Hello, my children. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Let's go to work. Turn around and tell somebody the bounce is what counts. Wasn't that a good illustration? The bounce is what counts. Now, I told Lenny just to share with you, you know, whatever God has on his heart. I know he'll do that. But the way that these guys have come into our lives has been providential. I mean, I know a lot of preachers. Have you ever recognized that? You realize that? And I know preachers that what they've done counts. I know some preachers, you'll never know what they've done counts. I know pastors of big churches that I really don't care to be their friends because they're not like me. They're, they're religious. They're corporate. It doesn't mean that I don't need them. They don't need me. But they're just not tuned to the same tuning fork. You can take two grand pianos and tune them to two different tuning forks, and they're, they'll be miscarred. There will be, you know, it, it won't be a, a sound that's familiar. It just would be, sound like my voice. That would be bad. But um, if a, if a pianist, grand pianist tuned to the same tuning fork, they sound beautiful. I mean, you have these two guys playing it, and it's beautiful. It makes a melody. But what happens, Gaynell's telling me to put my microphone up closer to my mouth. That's what a wife is for. Amen. But what happens that's interesting is that it's the same thing with people. It's the same thing with people that you meet. And these guys are all tuned to the same tuning fork. We didn't know each other, but God tuned us to the same tuning fork. That's why when we have these meetings and different ones speak, it doesn't make any difference who's scheduled to speak, that there's the same sound all the way through. I had Alan speak because Alan is a part of our body. I took him in when other people didn't want to take him in. I love Alan. I believe in him. I knew him when he was black-headed and young and good-looking. He's still nice-looking. I had to say that because Sharon walked in here. But I have a relationship with him. These other guys, Josh and different ones, Cody and Philip, different ones, they all have something to say. Cody stood me on my ear yesterday. Um, there's a guy that came in here from Hamilton that was here yesterday. He called Scott, and he was just ranting and raving how that what Cody spoke spoke to his heart. And that, that's the way we all feel. So, you know, you can have your favorites, but just let everybody be your favorite. And it'll be a, a value-added tax like in South Africa, and you don't even know what that is. Amen. You get your money back. Amen. Praise God. And so we want Lenny to come and share with us. Let me keep the mic up close to your mouth, if you will, and everybody can hear you. Don't be like me. Amen. <laughs> good morning. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Would you open your Bibles to Luke chapter 2? I just felt like this uh, this morning. Woo! Jesus. <laughs> Oh, wow. Praise God. <laughs> Big. Jesus. Jesus. Here we go. The Supreme Court just ruled, and I lost it off here. Somebody can find it. But the Supreme Court just ruled the parents seen, send, that send their children to private schools have a right to tuitions. In other words, that's a big thing. Jesus. 
Jesus. Father, we thank you for that. Father, we thank you for that, Heavenly Father, right now. We just thank you that, God, you've heard the prayers of the righteous Heavenly Father that you are moving. God, that there's a shift in our nation right now, Lord God. And Father, that we can send our kids to private schools, Heavenly Father, and still have the, the affordability, Lord God, and others that have a desire to go will go, Heavenly Father. Father, we thank you that children now can come to a school, Lord God, and hear the gospel, the whole gospel, Heavenly Father. God, that you're dragging people in, Heavenly Father. We thank you right now in Jesus' name that you're raising a generation, Lord God, that you're, you're using, Heavenly Father, a generation. Father, I thank you for the, the John the Baptist generation that you're calling in in this very hour to prepare the way of the Lord. Father, we thank you, God, that you're raising up a generation in this very hour, Heavenly Father, that you're moving things moving things, shifting things on the board in our favor, Lord God, but not for our favor, your favor, Lord God, that your glory would come right now in Jesus' name. We thank you. We thank you, God. We thank you, God. I'm going to just shift gears on that whole thing just because I, because we've been praying. I, I, I'm a, I work, um, I don't even know what I'm talking about right now, but here's the reality is every single Saturday morning for the last uh, 10 years now, 10 years, I run a a children's church program on the street. It's called King's Keep. From 10 o'clock, from 12 o'clock to 2 o'clock, every single Saturday, I take the church to the children. And I go to different types of communities, two very, uh, what we call at-risk communities, K kids that are being raised basically by themselves, raised by their grandparents, lots of uh, violence, lots of gang activity, lots of drug activity. In the midst of all that, we're bringing the gospel to them and uh, last year, uh, she's not here, Montana had come out with her husband Jordan and their youth group. They came to us in New Haven. We did a, a, a strike, a VBS. We, we do our own VBS. We spent an entire week uh, doing uh, children's ministry on the street in the two locations that we work. And out of that, an entire Afghanistanian family came to know Jesus Christ. <laughs> now, I live, I live in New England. Um, it is known as the, the, you know, this place of really just the headquarters of all uh, intellectualism. The, the main Ivy League schools all are in New England. Uh, Brown University, Yale University, Harvard, um, UPenn, uh, Cornell. They, they make this Ivy League school. The understanding is that they were schools that were originally intended to be places to raise up missionaries to be sent out to do the call of God. Yale New Haven is in my city. The uh, university, uh, Yale University is in my city, New Haven. It has sent out great men of God. Jonathan Edwards, one of them, had been a student there. He had been a president there. His grandchildren had gone there. Dwight, um, um, uh, Dwight went there. His, his grandson brought revival. There had been 19 revivals on Yale's campus historically. 19 revivals. We are still expecting another one in our city. We're believing that there will be another breakout at Yale University through the Divinity School and through the graduate school, undergrad school, that a, a revival that would begin to shift the mindsets of young people. So when the, when the Supreme Court allows children to be, come into private schools and, and have the affordable access to do so, what means is we have a shift in a generation that is going to see something happen. Now, we, we understand that uh, when we look at Gen Z, the, the generation that is right now, we have a tendency to call them lazy, apathetic, and everything else. We have a tendency to, to tear them down because they are growing up in a different type of era. And we understand that what we would consider the best language that I heard on a sociological level was they, they, they turned them fragile. Fragile. Now we have a generation, Gen Z is now doing things that we can never thought about before through the use of a telephone. They're able to transpire uh, messages 
through this phone, they're able to send messages all over the world. A young friend of mine uh, just had a meeting in Huntington Beach where he baptized 200 people at the beach. He basically got on TikTok and said, listen, if you've never been baptized, you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you want to get baptized, meet me down at Huntington Beach at this pier. I'll be there from 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock. And he went there expecting maybe 20, maybe 10 people. And he said 200 people showed up to be baptized in the water. Gen Z is reaching Gen Z in a way that we can't reach them. And the more that we come against them, the less we'll see fruit in them. The more that we attack them, seeing they're lazy, they're apathetic, and not realizing that the, there has been a cultural shift that has happened, and, and the, the reason being that we've protected them so much to a point that we've, we're at fault in a sense. And we think if they're not growing up like us, then how are they not performing on the way they do? The way they work is completely different than us because they have an understanding that they want to affect life. They want to be influential to a degree that begins to spin things around. The generation that is being born now, my son is part of that generation. My two boys are part of that generation. After Gen Z, do you know what the next generation is being called? The Alpha Generation. The alpha generation, that means you're, if your kids are under 12 years old and they're part of the alpha generation, meaning they are going to be the alpha males, alpha females on the earth. And if they catch the presence of God as young children, they'll begin to walk in the anointing of God and begin to preach the gospel in ways that we will never understand. It'll be a mixture of high-tech, influential places of being able to preach in multiple language at one time and have your voice be cast out amongst the globe. There'll be a generation that'll be marked by God. And because this generation has grown up in such a political strife that has happened, they don't believe a single thing that comes out of our mouths. They will fact check you as you're preaching. They will fact check you. And that for that reason, they will be like Bereans who understand the Word of God. They will study the Word of God, have a deep understanding. They are going to bring the Bible back to the simple, listic Bible, the simple gospel back into the church today. Listen. You know as well as I do that a, a large percentage of people that are preaching the gospel are no longer preaching the gospel. What they're preaching technically is secular humanism hid behind Christian terminology, but it is in the gospel. It is about you becoming the champion in every single story. And I'm here to tell you, you're not the champion. You're not the hero in the story. Jesus is the hero. Jesus, the outcome of every single story through the gospel is a revelation from Genesis to Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We get to be storytellers about the greatest story man. We get to be storytellers about the, the goodness of Jesus Christ. And sometimes we can get so caught up in our little clubs, our little tribes, that we miss it. I, I was thinking about this the other day. That, you know, here's John the Baptist in Mark chapter 1. He says, behold the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. His entire time of preaching in the wilderness has been telling people that I am just one person preparing the way of the Lord. And when Jesus shows up, he points to him and says, Behold the Lamb of God. And out of the, the, the rest of his disciples that are following, we know that two of them, Andrew and John, leave John the Baptist's ministry and they begin to pursue Jesus Christ. And I started thinking about this the other day. There is a point in the gospel where John the Baptist is in prison and he sends his disciples back to Jesus to ask him, are you the one that we've been waiting for? Now, I don't know if you ever thought about this, but if my entire ministry was built on, I'm preparing the way for the Lord and I just told you, behold the Lamb of God, why are you still with me? 
Why do you still have disciples? John, I want to know, why do you still have disciples? If I was under sitting underneath John the Baptist and he would have said, my entire ministry has been built around that individual, I would have left him immediately and began to follow him. But somehow, John the Baptist is in prison and still has disciples with him. Listen, we're the same today. We haven't changed. We'll get caught up in some type of tribalism that we'll get caught up in some religiosity. We'll get caught up in some church type of thing that we forget that this is about Jesus Christ. We'll miss the move of God. This is why this is so pivotal to be here this week because God is doing something on the earth. God is shifting things around. We can look at everything that is happening. Things are getting difficult. Things are getting hard. Things seem like they're out of control. But God is in control the entire time. He is sifting things. He's moving things around on our behalf because you're his children. You will never lack You'll never desire, you'll never want because he's your heavenly father who's going to provide for you everything you need in every single storm of your life. This is Jesus Christ right now that's beginning to shift things. And I, I want you to get excited about what's happening on the earth. We can, we can go in doom and gloom, but the reality is we're living in a time frame where the gospel now is being preached behind closed doors through a simple phone a few weeks ago, I was preaching in the nation of Pakistan while I was in my office at 4 o'clock in the morning, in my office, sitting in my chair, preaching through this phone to another man in Pakistan who was interpreting my message to his congregation. And people were getting healed. People were getting saved. God was doing deliverance. Through this simple technology, we're able to go to places where, where God, we had missionaries haven't been able to go. I met a man who, who came out of the Taliban at the highest levels. He was arrested, thrown in prison. He was beaten. He had a, a legitimate, like, angel of the Lord, like Peter, came to him in the middle of the night, drug him out of the nation, brought him into Nepal, into Nepal, into Turkey, and then now he's living somewhere under secrecy. He takes Snapchat videos and sends them back to the rest of his friends that are still part of the Taliban preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ through Snapchat, and he's winning them over to the gospel of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Effectively, if God has done this, continue to do this, we, he knows that the perfect time and season, uh, we can think about it like the, the Greek language was, was indoctrinated into all people groups. It was one language that everyone had to kind of know, the Greek language, and then when the times of Romans took over, they, in, they kept the Greek language and they began to build roads to all out, outstretches of the world, right? All roads lead to Rome. Why? Because if they had war, they needed people, armies to get there as quick as possible. So in the perfect time in Jesus, God the Father drops Jesus Christ on the scene when there is a universal language and there's roads all over the world for the gospel to get everywhere. We're seeing it right now. We have a, a universal language with universal roads to get the gospel ever we want to go as long as we're willing to actually preach the good news of Jesus Christ. Not a secular humanism, not an, a Western theology, not a I'm going to be the giant and the giant say, no, this gospel is about a man who came down, emptied himself completely out of divinity, walked up the earth, was crucified, buried, and rose again. That gospel we still preach 2,000 years later because it still resonates with us today. It is the only thing that is going to shake a nation. It is the only thing that we put our faith and trust in. It is in politics. It is in science. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. My faith and my faith alone has been grounded in one simple understanding. It is in the matter of intellectualism. It is about being completely enamored, falling in love with Jesus Christ. My passion comes that I encountered a man who knew everything about me and spoke everything everything to me. And when he began to read me, like the woman at the well, I finally, affectionately, my heart was given over to him. It is a passion that thrusts me to go everywhere he asked me to go, to do whatever he wants me to do because of this gospel of Jesus Christ. 
It is in the second place. It is the first place. It is the living thing, active and breathing. It is sharper than a two-edged sword. It cuts through bone and marrow. It is the very thing that speaks to our soul and our spirit. It is the very thing that causes us to breathe in the morning. It is the very thing that delights and brings joy into our life. It is the very thing in the midst of darkness. It will bring light. In the midst of confusion, it will bring understanding. In the midst of anything that you're going through, it is is this word of God. God is doing something. God is waking children. My, my two, I, I just started telling this a couple days ago to my sons. It just hit me one day. I was, I was reading through the Message Bible, and I was reading, uh, I, I love Eugene Peterson's translation, so I was reading it, and there's a part where he begins to talk about John the Baptist, and he's, the, the terminology that Eugene Peterson uses is, I'm a thunder in the desert. When he speaks about John the Baptist, I'm a thunder in the desert. I looked at my son, I said, you're a thunder in the desert. My son goes, what? I said, you're a thunder in the desert. Wherever you go, preach this gospel of Jesus Christ. Wherever you go, my son, who's seven years old, has been praying, came to me one day, crying and weeping. Seven years old, was crying and weeping. I said, what are you crying about? He goes, Dad, I keep on telling everybody in my school about Jesus, but no one's coming to the Lord. And I said, just keep on praying. Keep on doing what you're doing. And eventually, over time, one of his friends came to know Jesus Christ. said, Dad, one of my friends got saved. And I said, preach the gospel. Just preach the gospel. Just preach the gospel. My five-year-old son gave me a Father's Day note that was made in his school, and it said, what does your dad like to do? It says, my dad likes to preach the gospel. They said, what kind of music does your dad like to listen to? He likes to listen to Jesus music. He began to ask him, what does your dad like to do? He likes to sit on the corner and preach the gospel. This is my five-year-old son. And the, one, the teacher asked him, what does your dad do? He said, he's a pastor, and he preaches the gospel. So when I go to that school, the lady opens up my door and says, are you Pastor Lenny? I said, yes, I am. And she goes, can we sit down and talk? And I said, oh, I'd love to sit down and talk. And she said, what can, I what can I help you with? And she begins to tell me that what is happening in the school systems today, an unbeliever who is terrified of the information that is being thrown down the pipeline of what's going to happen. Do you know that there's a young man who identifies as a cat? A cat. A teacher literally had to bring in a bowl of water and put it on the, on the floor for this young man to drink out of it as a cat. Another young student asked the kid, walked over to him, began to touch him, began to pet him as a cat. The kid jumped out, hostility, scratched this young man's face so bad, it began to bleed. And you know who they blamed in this altercation? They blamed the young man who went over to pet the young cat, supposedly. They blamed him, not the kid who goes to school saying, I identify as a cat. Now, you know it as well as I do. It, common sense will tell you. Your children will desire a lot of things. But at some point in time, you have to tell them, listen, that's not who you are. At some point in time, the gospel has to cut, get down into someone's life and begin to wake people up and say, listen, you can, you can say whatever you want, but at the end of the day, you are what you are. You, you can identify, you know, you can, you can say that I, I, I'm this, I'm that, but the reality is my identity only comes not from my understanding. My identity comes from this gospel. We're living in a day and age where what, what, what if we, if it continues to go down this cycle, what will happen to a, ge to a generation? Do you know that when transgenderism becomes mainstream, it is a sign that that political government is about to collapse? That has historically been proven over and over again. When transgenderism begins to become mainframe in a political society, it is, the, it is, a, value, it is a, a value sign that begins to show that this government is going to implode. What is the answer? The gospel of Jesus Christ. 
What is the response to us? The gospel of Jesus Christ. What is the response to a community of LGBTQ? It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the only thing that is going to bring them in. It is this passionate, loving God who is pursuing them at all means, at all costs, at all desires, even when they didn't even know God. He's pursuing them. This is why it's so important right now that we would see that God would begin to open up doors for young children to begin to hit the school system under a framework where the gospel is freely preached to individuals. I have a young friend of mine, a friend of mine in the state of New York who during COVID took her son out of school because they were going to initially at the at that time, every kid was going to have to get uh, vaccinated. So she took her child out because he has some, he's on the spectrum. And she was afraid that if he got the shot, they would like, push him deeper into the spectrum. So she pulled him out. You know, the state of New York tried to take her children away from her. If it wasn't for the fact that she is financially wealthy and had enough resource, financial resources to get a good uh, lawyer, she might have lost her kids over something as simple as that. When in the world does a government know better than us as parents? what our kids want. That's where we are. And when we see a shift happen right now, as we just heard the news, when we hear a shift happen, we should rejoice in our hearts that God is doing something on the scene, that there is a refuge. Listen, he established a Goshen right now. That's what we're hearing. He established Goshen. He established a refuge. He established a city where people can go and be under the protection of what's going being fed down to them over and over again. Day after day after day, the nonsense is being taught. Now, I understand one thing. The simplicity that, you know, that 3% of the people actually control the culture of a room. 3% of the people control the atmosphere of a room, 3%. So when I pulled my son and put him in public school, the very first thing I did was get on that board. And I began to sit at every single board meeting that ever happened down the pike, and I began to fight for everything that I felt was ungodly. And I began to say, no, 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 we're not doing that. We're not, we're not associated with that. I, and, and here again, only 3%. I learned real quickly that most parents don't show up to the board meeting at all. It is a small group of people who show up to board meetings, begin to speak their voice, and because their voice is the only voice that is heard, that their voice is then pushed. So who do you need to blame? Where is the Christian church at when they have an opportunity to get onto boards and begin to speak on behalf of what their heart's desire is for the benefit of all children? Where is the church where we can actually take over small meetings and begin to influence things on a such a way? Not believe me, I don't believe that we can legislate moral beliefs or moral character. That can only happen through the gospel of Jesus Christ. But what I do believe is that we can begin to influence certain situations and certain circumstances to begin to back, hold back the hand of the enemy and begin to see a cultural shift where young people will desire and have a hunger and a thirst for Jesus Christ. Amen. I walked through the city streets during our time of Advent from what we know to be Ash Wednesday all the way to Easter Sunday. I walked the streets with a cross. I felt the Lord told me to build a cross, walk through my city, and begin to pray over my city with the cross behind me. And I, I remember when I got the word, I felt like that's not really my ministry, Lord, but if that's what you desire, I'll do so. I got the cross out of my car and I decided I was going to walk basically a, a half a mile down one street and then a half mile down one of the busiest streets in our city, Chapel. And I said I was going to walk down it, half mile, then walk half mile back, throw the cross to my car, go home. I literally made it three blocks. Three blocks. I, I'm, I'm passing by the bus depot, the bus station where this station where it takes the, you can take the bus anywhere in the city. As I'm walking past it, I'm coming up one block from Yale University, right outside the corner of Yale University. As I hit that corner, I hear someone say, yo, 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 my man, my man. And here I am with the cross. Got my AirPods in, listening to worship music, International House of Prayer. Yo, 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 my man, my man. So I turn around, here comes this guy running at me with no shirt on, and I'm thinking to myself, I hope he doesn't throw a punch at me. 
comes running up to me, says, yo, yo, what's up with the cross? What's up with the cross? And I said to her, I felt like the Lord told me I was going to walk through the city streets with this cross, praying for the city. He says, listen, can you pray for me? And I said, what's going on? He says, I'm, I'm fighting a heroin addiction. And I said, listen, I came out of heroin addiction. And he says, tell me your story. I shared with him for about 10 minutes of story. As I'm sharing the story with him, another guy comes around me, a bigger guy, he's probably 6'5", about 260, comes around and begins to listen to the story. And he begins to say, how do you know this guy? I said, I don't know. He just yelled out my name. And so we're, now we're conversating. The three of us are conversating. I'm telling the story. He's listening in. And the other guy begins to weep. He says, listen, pray for me. I need prayer so bad. Can you please pray for me? And I said, all right, I will. So I had the cross. I didn't know what to do with it. The other guy grabs the cross. I'll hold the cross for you. So he begins to hold the cross for me. I start praying for this guy, and as I start praying for him, he breaks down, starts weeping and crying. I said, do you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? He goes, yes, I do. And he falls to his knees, literally gets down to his knees. I didn't ask him to do that. He gets down to his knees. I get down on the ground with him. We're both crying. We're both weeping. I turn around. I see this guy, 6'5", 260, holding the cross, and he's weeping. And I'm thinking to myself, what's going on right now? And then two seconds later, a, a woman that I know who was a prostitute comes running over, running over to the crowd and begins to say, Pastor Lenny, what's going on? And I said, I, I don't really know. This guy stopped me. I'm praying for him. This guy's holding the cross. He's weeping. And she asked him, well, what's going on with you? And he says, well, I'm feeling something I've never felt before. And she goes, what is it? He goes, I don't know. I don't have words for it. I don't have a language for it. But I feel like there's something happening in my soul. And I stood up real quick and I said, that's the sovereign spirit of the living God on you. I said, accept Jesus Christ. Take your cross. You are carrying the cross. Take the cross. Accept it. God wants to kill you, completely kill you this day so that he can resurrect who you really are. And as he's about to give it, he, he pushes the cross over to this young woman who I know is a prostitute, says, hold this. And she holds the cross. And he, I turn around and start giving him the, the salvation message. Ask him, do you want to accept Jesus Christ? Now, she starts weeping. And I'm like, what is going on? And before long, I, I, real quickly, about two, three minutes later, I have about 30, 40 people around me asking me what's happening. And I'm saying, it's the presence of the living God. God is doing something in the community. God is not done in this generation generation. God isn't done yet. He's in the miracle working business. He hasn't stopped. He hasn't been cut off. You haven't had your ears tuned in to what he's been saying. Now your ears are being tuned in to the voice of God. And as the 30 people start watching, they start asking what's happening. And I start telling them. Then a police car drives by because we're blocking now the city sidewalk and spilling in to the city. He drives by and he goes, Pastor, what's going on? And I said, I don't know. These, I don't even know these people. They just came out of nowhere. And, and I, I don't, you know, I'm trying to avoid getting the ticket. And then finally he says to me, he goes, listen, I'm going to stop right here, turns on his headlights, and starts guiding traffic around the crowd as more and more people start showing up. 30-something people give their life to Jesus Christ that day. But here's the crazy thing. A week later, a friend of mine says, I want to go out with you. I heard, heard what happened. I want to go out with you. So I take him and two of his friends, their elders at a different church in a different city. And we start walking. And we're about half a mile into it, and I get tired. And I say to him, hey, walk, walk with the cross. He says, no, no, that's, that's your job. We're just kind of walking behind you, praying. And I said, no, I, I hear you, but I'm tired. I want you to carry the cross. Three elders of a church. When he grabs the cross, he begins crying. And I said, what's going on? He says, Lenny, I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. I'm ashamed to carry this cross. I'm a sinner in need of a Savior falls to the ground, starts yelling at the top of his lungs, I'm a sinner in need of a savior. And I run over to him, start holding him, saying, listen, just whatever it is going on in your life, just repent right now. God has, is not done with you. God's just going to start with you. It's just going to start now. Whatever you've been asking for God for a long time, it's been on pause because of your lifestyle. But repent right now, and God's going to restart, refire. 
And he begins to weep out. I'm a sinner in need of a savior. And his buddy, I look at his buddy, hold the cross. And his buddy's looking at me like, I can't hold the cross. And I'm like, why not? And he's like, I, I just can't hold the cross. I'm like, why not? And he goes, I don't, I, I've been, I don't know. Like, I've been an elder for a long time. People know me in this community. I, I feel ashamed. And I'm like, I understand you feel ashamed of carrying the cross because now it's getting real. You can't be the Christian that you pretend to be in the church four walls and then leave the church walls and become this other identity because you're trying to, to navigate two different cultural worlds. It's like, that day is over. You must be the same person that you're in the building, must be the same person that you are 24 hours a day. Yeah. He gets on the ground, starts calling out, I'm a sinner in need of a savior. And as I'm there, there's a barber shop across the street and a guy comes out still with his mock on. Half a hair cut. Sees him, he says, why are my elders out in the street? Comes running across and begins to say, what's going on? And his elder looks at him with tears in his eyes, says, I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I'm a sinner in need of a savior. That's all he can say as he's weeping and weeping and weeping. And this young gentleman who's part of their congregation gets down on the ground and starts weeping, saying, I'm a sinner in need of a savior. I'm a sinner in need of a savior. Looks at me, pulls out of his pocket a, a, a bag of dope and hands it to me. I'm a sinner in need of a savior. And then his barber comes running out to see what's going on and runs over and sees the guy, he's cutting his hair, his friend on the ground, I'm a sinner in need of savior, just hand me a bag of dope. And then he sees his church elder and sees this guy, and he sees three guys now on the ground crying out. And he looks at me and I look at him, I said, today's the day of salvation, you need to get right with God right now. That's what's happening right now. And he says, man, I, I've been, I grew up in church. I know everything about church. And I said, yeah, you've been hurt by church, but the church is in Jesus Christ. It's been misrepresented by many people who consider themselves part of the ecclesia, but they're not. Today's the day to get over your offense and come to Jesus. And that barber got on the ground. I didn't ask him to get on the ground. He got on the ground and said, I want to accept Jesus Christ. I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And as soon as he did that, I said, give me license to walk into the barber shop and begin to preach the gospel. This is what's happening right now. And 10 young men gave their lives to Jesus Christ that day. We're living in a day and hour where all you need to do is preach the gospel. People are mourning. People are weeping. People are scared. They're living in fear. They see all the news. They hear everything possible. They're looking for someone to tell them what is the answer, what is the response. They're waiting for you to open up your mouth and say, it's Jesus. They're waiting for us to tell them the simple thing that we know, that we hear, that we sing songs about, that we cry about, that we do everything in this building. But God is in the hour of taking the church outside of a building. Listen, you don't go to church, you are the church. Wherever you go, you are a walking house of prayer. You are a revival meeting waiting to happen. The gathering is already created. The platform's already been made. COVID, Black Lives Matter, social uh, uh, unrest, political strife, government upon wars upon wars, abortion to the place of where laws are being passed where you can abort a child 28 days after it's been born. All these things are happening right now. And people are asking questions, waiting for the response. And the voice your voice is what they're wanting to hear. When you can sit down with them and begin to speak into their lives. I'm going to leave you one last thing. All you guys over the age of 40, over 50, stand up. I don't want to shame you guys. If you're over 45, 50, stand up. The first half of your life, First half of your life, first half of your life, whether we want to believe it or not, it's been ego driven. Ego driven. You can sit down with young pastors, young preachers, and they'll tell you if they're real honest that they love preaching more than they love Jesus. 
first half of your life. You hit that midlife crisis, and at that midlife crisis, you can do two things. You can buy a red Ferrari and get the young girl, or you can allow yourself to die to the gospel of Jesus Christ and let him resurrect it. And the second half of your life will be lived out of the place of your soul and spirit. And how you live out of the soul and the spirit is a place of serving. Serving one another. But if you don't have a passion, then what do I do? If you don't have something that causes you to wake up in the morning to say, this is what I'm called. And I'm not just talking about preaching the gospel. I'm talking, what has God called you to do as an individual? What's that thing that wakes you up in the morning? What's that thing that you love talking to or love talking about that other people are so tired about hearing it, but you can't help it? That every opportunity you get a chance to talk, this is what you're talking about. That people run away from you. And it's, listen, you need people to run away from you. You got to find some people that are, are heart connected to that passion. You got to ask yourself, God, what is the passion that you put into me? I've heard this once before. If you were to ask your wife or your close friend what your passion is and they can't tell you what it is, then you don't have a passion. What is your passion? Church, I'm asking you this morning, what is the one thing that you burn for day and night, night and day? What is the one thing that causes you to wake up in the middle of the night crying and weeping? What is the one thing that causes you to get out of bed every single morning when you don't want to get out of bed, but you get out of bed because there's a passion in your life that is causing you to wake to say, this is the day that we're going to see it. This is the day that we're going to see it. This is the day that we're going to believe for it. This is the day that we're going to see it. Listen, I've been praying over my city for now 14 years years for revival. And every single day, I'm asking, this is the day, God. This is the day. This is the day. This is the day. What do you burn for? Father, I thank you. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, Lord God, I pray that you put a burning desire, a burning passion in every individual here this morning, Lord God. God, that you would ring their bells, Heavenly Father, that they would hear the sound, the clarion call, the Macedonian call that says, here am I, come to me. Father, we're asking that there be a passion instilled into their spirit that says, this is the one thing that I've been called to do. My five-year-old son, David, sitting at Chili's one day, got caught up eyes wide open, looking at the ceiling, lost in a trance for about two or three minutes. Finally snaps out of it, and I look at him and said, David, what happened? He said, Dad, I saw it. I saw it, Dad. And I said, what did you see? He goes, I saw an invention, but God said, not yet. I saw an invention, but God said, not yet. The very thing I did next was put him in a camp to start construction, building things. He has a passion in his heart. At five years old, he'll tell you, I'm an engineer. He has a passion in his heart. What did you burn for this morning? Jesus. I don't think we need to go any further. You're welcome to leave. Take this with you. If you want to come and pray, you come and pray. If you want to give offering, just let on the platform. That's what we've told you we're going to do. And um, if you're in a position, you know, to give a good offering, we appreciate what you give. Every little bit counts. Lenny will be up tonight. We'll have someone speak just briefly, and then Lenny's going to take us to the throne. So God bless you. You can go with God. <laughs>